Today I sat down with Fernando Campos, who is one of the co-founders of Marketplace Ops, an Amazon brand management agency, working with some serious brands and also the owner of, I believe, a 30 plus million dollar Amazon business himself. Uh, The guy is beyond impressive in terms of how he approaches everything in life and in business. Uh, He's a seriously seasoned entrepreneur and living an incredibly digitally nomadic life. And uh, we talk about a lot of different topics from fitness and CrossFit to the mental game to the businesses that he's building and how he approaches it. Um, It was a really illuminating episode for me and an opportunity to really dig into someone that I've really just been impressed from the onset. And so... Again, like every episode, this is for you. I hope you get as much out of it as I do. Welcome to Successful Scales, the show where I talk to world-class professionals on what it takes to scale successful businesses. I dive deep asking questions to people who are running unicorn businesses, to raising funds, to buying businesses, mergers and acquisitions, IP and patent law, what is to manage performance management? I mean, the list goes on. The idea really is how do I create knowledge and learning for you guys listening in? And of course, myself getting the floor with people who I, in many cases, would never dream to share a room with. Before we jump into the episode, I've got to give a special thank you to our sponsors. Firstly, over at Global Wide Advisors, a leading digital consumer products investment bank focused on optimizing the sales process. An incredible team, always happy to pick up the phone and educate you or anyone about the sales process and what you should really consider and can obviously help take you to market or even acquire businesses. I ring them for just about everything these days. Us over at Multiply Me, we are the end-to-end executive search and HR function into the Philippines, helping find better talent and onboarding them effectively. And last but not least, Escala our management consultancy focused on process improvement where we help build better systems for your business. That's all the ads you're going to get from me, ladies and gentlemen. The rest is all about learning. I hope you really enjoy and get as much out of these sessions as I do sitting face-to-face with some of the world-renowned leaders in their respective fields, asking them the tough questions that they're not often asked. All right, Fernando, welcome to an episode of Successful Scales, my friend. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me, Yoni. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm stoked. And I know we've tried to make this happen a couple of times and it's largely been my fault, but uh, just really, really uh, thrilled and appreciative that you've been flexible. So, uh, thanks for taking the time and and being available, mate. I really appreciate it. I've gotten to know you a little bit... uh, I've gone to know you a little bit just now. We were having, yeah, you know, pretty solid conversation about some of the things happening in market and where we're at. But, you know, for those listening at home who aren't familiar with you or marketplace ops, love to sort of have you tell the story rather than me trying to fumble it and uh, undersell you. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks, man. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so my business partner Nick and I have been in the Amazon space since 2014. I guess, yeah, prior to that, um, we both came from startups. Uh, he was like the head of like new business at like a company called Tasca. So actually, you're probably familiar with them uh, through like, yeah, Multiply Me. Um, but yeah, I mean, huge outsourcing company. He was like, you know, one of their early employees helped them scale um, from like four to like 40 million revenue. Um, for me, I was. Employee number two at a Y Combinator backed company called AnyPerk, uh, helped them scale from like literally zero product, like I don't even think we had a website at the time, uh, to like millions in revenue. And then left, uh, we both left after about two years. And then, um, and, and we knew each other from college, we were best friends. And so we just kind of quit our jobs and we're like, all right, we're, we're going to start our business. We don't really know exactly what we're going to do, but thankfully we had enough saved to give us like enough runway to figure it out. And um, we knew that we were going to do e-commerce just because we we're, we're more business backgrounds like relative to like uh, engineers. And so 
um, we kind of started messing around with like Shopify for about like maybe five months kind of doing like a kind of a wholesale model building a a site for uh for like kind of highlighting products that uh the follower of like tim ferris would love and so kind of in the intersection of tech and design kind of like huckberry today um but yeah we realized like how hard it was how difficult the margins were and how difficult user acquisition was and so yeah when we were kind of forecasting like our growth rate and everything we realized like oh man we're gonna run out of money like fast and so we decided like okay screw this passion project like let's just make money and so the first thing that occurred to us which is kind of funny in hindsight was selling on ebay and so we're like okay cool like we'd heard a lot of people had done that and then one day we just received a package um at nick's place and it's like an amazon package and we're like wait why are we going to sell on eBay? We don't even buy anything from eBay. It's like, it's a pain in the ass to, to buy it from there. And then, you know, but at the time it wasn't really well known that like you could actually sell on Amazon. And so we're like, well, can you? And then literally Google, like, can you sell on Amazon? Like literally like the, the most like basic like keyword search. And then of course, like amazing came up. Uh, and then we're like, well, this is crazy. And then just like that day, just quick decision. Uh, we left like the Shopify site and then just like plowed through um, course after course. Um, and then, yeah, it was crazy. Like the, the first month that we launched, maybe like four months later when the products arrived from China, uh, we ended up selling more in that one month than we had in like the five months combined on Shopify. And we're like, whoa, like this is it. Um, yeah, and that's that's basically how we got into the space. I mean, yeah, since then, I mean, yeah, we've been very fortunate. I mean, we got in really early, right, 2014. So we sold um, all in a little over 150 million, uh, the majority actually from our own brands, not uh, through the agency. Uh, but yeah, we, you know, started and sold, um, yeah, quite a few uh, Amazon brands, like more Amazon native brands. Uh, and then we've also started an agency called Marketplace Ops. Uh, where we help a lot of brands, usually like kind of in the high six figures, uh, seven figures, and then we help them scale uh, to eight figures. And then we also, as a fun side project, we started um, Pixelfy and sold that last year as well. Wow, very impressive. I didn't realize Pixelfy was yours as well. Um, that was that was to Carbon Six? Uh, no, so that's Pixel Me. Uh, so we sold to Rebate Key. Yeah. So yeah, we were, we were definitely inspired by them. Uh, yeah. No, it's all good. Um, it's, it's Ian. Ian sells, right? It's Rebate Key. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we're good friends with them. And then, yeah, it, um, yeah at a certain point, we wanted to, to really focus on the agency. And so, um, yeah, and Ian had been interested for, for a long time. So it worked out. Wow, mate, super impressive background. And I love how, casu- you know, so casually, like, yeah, about 150 million in sales, most of them our brands. Um, mate, really, really impressive um, to, to say the least. Was I, was I picking up that you guys studied engineering together? Oh, no, no, we're definitely uh, business guys. Sorry, I think, um, yeah, the, why I mentioned that is, you know, we came from tech, right? So I worked at like a YC company. And so I think, you know, normally, at least at the time, like I think as you're kind of, uh, if you're in that tech world, like I was living in San Francisco, I was hanging out like with all like Y Combinator founders. And so naturally my inclination was always like, oh, well, I'm gonna start a tech company. So I need to recruit like, you know, an engineering co-founder or something. But I think as we realized, it's like, you know, we're, if we're not technical, I think we're always going to be at a kind of a somewhat of a disadvantage. Obviously, there there are the stories of the like non technical founders that that end up making it, but you know by and large, like you kind of want to have that background. And ideally, you started programming when you were young, right? And so we decided that we wanted to move into a space where we um, where we were more set up to thrive. And so that for us was like e-commerce relative to like trying to build whatever, like the next Stripe or some, something more technical. Got it. And, and it sounds to me, you said you've built, and I'm not sure if I quote it correctly, but you said you've sold, you know, 150 plus million. You've done 150 plus million in revenue, a lot of them through your brands. Do you still have brands live in market that you're running through marketplace ops or have you exited those businesses? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, so we actually do own probably like yeah, four or five supplement brands right now that we've started and and launched ourselves. And so uh, we have like a completely separate like marketing team that kind of like owns the product development and then the um, the launching and ad- advertising. But it does leverage a lot of our shared resources uh, team. So like you know, obviously the finance team, HR, creative, supply chain um, are, are shared between the agency and then the and then the brands. And so we kind of look at it as a, a kind of a financial flywheel, if you sense, uh, like the agency naturally drives more free cash flow, but it's harder to scale, harder to uncouple payroll from revenue. Uh, but the brands require a lot more cash, but it's easier to, uh, to scale. And so it kind of, they work in tandem. I knew I was going to enjoy this conversation before we even got on it. And uh, I'm already right there, mate, because you're wearing... You're wearing many you're wearing many hats, right? You're running multiple businesses, but it's very very apparent at least to me that it's a strategic decision. You sort of highlighted a little bit about about it, but before I sort of dig into some of those aspects of how you're running the operation, you know, you you're essentially right now you're a house of brands or a house of businesses in in ways if you sort of look at it from the macro perspective but you're doing it what sounds to me like quite intentionally right you're trying to free up cash flow like you said through the agency and my my question my very direct question to you as an ex agency guy i spent 10 years in creative at creative advertising and digital marketing agencies and as someone personally where you couldn't pay me money to to become an agency owner again but straight up i just i, I wouldn't do it what you know what had you sort of move away from just owning, you know, you own all the outcomes, right? When you are the brand owner, it's, uh, you know, I'm on my own time. I build my own, you know, I build my own KPIs, expectations, resources, etc. And, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you the punchline or I know, I guess the answer to the next question is that Ultimately, it's the clients that are always the ones that are fucking up your day, right? They're the ones who aren't delivering on deadlines. They're the ones who aren't getting you what you need when you need it, right? I'm, I'm, uh, correct me if I'm speaking out of turn. Um, but just, 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 just sort of walk me through like the evolution of, you know, and I'd say like when you look at the traditional agency experience, like people work in agencies, people work in agencies, and then they, either graduate or they decide to move client side because now it's like, cool, I'll kick my feet up, I'll handle the budget, I'll tell the agency what the campaign little idea is and they'll actually do the delivery work. You sort of taken the opposite approach. And so I'd love to hear sort of the the very, like how did you even get into starting to deviate from owning your own brands to actually starting to service clients with marketplace ops? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I I know exactly. Yeah, those text messages from your clients, like on a Saturday at midnight, you're just like, fuck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know what you're, um, look, I think so. Why we started it, um, you know, we started it back in like I would say 2019. I would say, or maybe actually late 2018. Uh, I would say the reason that we started it in the beginning was we wanted to make it ourselves more self-financeable. I think also, you know, the space has changed so dramatically since then. But I think, you know, understanding, uh, you know, cash conversion cycles is, is a huge part of like why we made the decision. Because at the time, it was just so hard to get lenders to finance and i'm talking about like large amounts right like more than a million dollars in like a line of credit or um even in like a term loan for like an e-commerce based business especially if you're an amazon native right because you have no receivables you have no real collateral like they they won't lend against inventory sometimes in in, in fba and so you know we're doing like 30 million a year but like we're basically having to go out and raise like really high interest rate uh promissory notes and so the idea was like, okay, we have this like stellar team, like we know how to run Amazon businesses. We're like pretty well known in this space because of like Pixelfy and everything. And so maybe we can leverage that credibility. We can bring on clients um, and then we'll one, like learn from some of our clients because maybe they're more of a D2C brand and like, it just kind of helps like in terms of like a knowledge base for us. And sometimes we'll get these crazy budgets and then they're like, okay, we want to launch 
we need to spend whatever 80 grand on this launch and then it's like okay well we've never done that prior like how are we gonna like allocate that kind of budget right and so i think there's like the the first part was like and the most important part i think for us was just becoming self-financeable and not having to go out and fundraise all the time uh the second piece was yeah like around um yeah just like knowledge i think in terms of, kind of like similar to like what you mentioned before is like you learn so much from having a podcast right and just like us we're meeting with like tons of brilliant founders all the time and so we'll learn other areas outside of amazon that like we wouldn't actually get as much exposure to and then the third thing which truthful is truthful and you don't really see it like all the time it's not as apparent but is that you you get to run a better business by having an agency, right? Because I think internally you can be a little soft on each other and you're like more kind, but clients, if you're if you're paying someone like a good amount of money, you have high expectations of that like customer experience and, and results. And so I think uh, those are like a lot of the, the bigger benefits for us, uh, I would say. But and then I think, yeah, to your point around like the client, like, so much of it is around client selection. And like, you know, I think we learned that from a lot of friends. I think Nick is really good about selecting the right clients that have the right temperament, that have realistic expectations. And truthfully, we only take on ones where like we know that we can help them scale. We're not going to do a specific category just uh, that nobody cares about on Amazon and is just going to churn in, in three or six months. And so, um, so yeah, hopefully that that kind of answers a little bit. No, that's a that, listen. That's a very strategic move, and you know you're sort of hitting it on. It was intentional as to why you went in there. You didn't want to, and especially back then, and it's still really challenging. You know, let's let's call a spade a spade here. No one's just handing out free cash for Amazon businesses, and if they are, they're taking a pretty high interest, you know, repayment. The ARR on that is, you know, it's not what you're going to get if you're a brick and mortar store. It's not what you're going to get against, you know, virtually anything else. It's just we're still not at that point in the time in history where e-commerce businesses are actually seen as the true viability of the business that they are and the market will catch up, but it's probably still going to take, you know, some, you know, some pretty good years would be my guess. So, um, very, 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 very clearly articulated how and why you got into it. And it makes a whole lot of sense. And I think for anyone listening in here, who's either running an agency or has a brand, you know, there is a reason there's, there's a reason to make it from a financial engineering perspective. You know, you are, finding a way to be intelligent about your you know self-sufficiency as to running sort of your primary business in the brand itself and, and getting it to another level but to your other point you're not going to have the same level of pressure as you will when you're trying to service clients and so you're pushed honestly to the to the absolute limit of service delivery and exploration and how and why and when people are paying you money to to have you know, uh, an expected result if you don't deliver and you strike me as someone who is not uh, one to, to, to take a, a negative uh, delivery or experience uh, all that well, um, you know, you're going to learn, you're going to learn a lot. Um, and so, I think it's, you know, it's just that absolute um, mutual beneficial experience where you're pushed beyond scope, you're getting exposure to other brands. But I think to your point and to your partner in Nick making very good decisions on client selection, uh, you know, it's absolutely critical. You know, we I know for us inside of Multiply Me as a business, you know, when we started working um, or when we started the business sort of three, three and a half years ago, you know, it's like I'll take anything I can get. I'll work with a founder who's looking for four hours of work because like we have no, literally no revenue coming in and I would get on calls at three in the morning if time zones didn't make sense because, you know, you were, you know, you were sort of was hustling, which, you know, I do not advocate for at all for anyone at any stage in their career. And it's something that I really stand against, but I lived it and went through that. And I guess my point is today, like we're building teams inside of Multiply Me. We want to work with companies that are more well established, that have a very clear understanding of what it is to onboard and train and educate and empower their team members to actually make good decisions and so i think it's like a a very natural evolution but it sounds to me like you guys might have made that decision right off the get-go did you did you have a moment in time like when you guys started where you sort of had to 
learn um, through your experiences that, you know, there is a particular client profile or how we want to work or was it always very intentional? You know, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, I think we definitely got more intentional, but I think we started pretty intentional. Thankfully, we had like a lot of good friends that had run agencies and they were, yeah, very generous, honestly, with like, dude, don't like, uh, don't be dumb. Don't like, you know, don't choose like the really cheap clients. Like the best clients are the ones, truthfully, that are not like really balking at like the service fees or anything because they understand like the importance of like, look, if you can get me to X to Y in this period of time is way better than me, you know, paying a little bit more versus like choosing some like bad agency that I'm going to waste six months of time or or potentially like drop in sales, drop in, in the bottom line. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think we've definitely fine tuned it a little bit in terms of like certain categories are just hard. Like beverage for us is is really challenging unless you're just like willing to light money on fire a lot of time because you're going against like the biggest brands with the largest budgets uh, and then you have crazy FBA fees. And so naturally it's, it's, a, it's a tough category. I think that's one that we've like kind of... Um, yeah, that we've learned. Uh, but I think besides that, like, yeah, truthfully, we've pretty consistent in terms of our client selection, thankfully, from the beginning. No, no thanks to me, to be honest. Uh, it's all Nick. Uh, so I'll give him a shout out on that one. But yeah, so I can totally relate to the hustling in the in the early days. Yeah. And and I think it like, you know, in ways there's like a, an aspect where it's like a rite of passage and you sort of You know, you you think, I would say, at least I did early days, like the more hours I put in, the better the result is and like hard work pays off and and it does, hard work does pay off. But it's in in my mind today, it's all about consistency. It's about showing up every day, not working 12, 16 hour days and trying to literally burn the candle at both ends. Like, you know, you only have so much uh, energy that you can expend. And, you know, for me personally, like life is definitely changed over the last three years i've got a son now i didn't have a dog when i started the businesses like you know lots of things lots of things have definitely um changed but i guess where i'm driving with all of this is you you guys both seem to be attracted to early stage uh businesses right you you both started you were at a y combinator business you helped grow it from early stage um so too did your co-founder obviously in, in, in task us and where you guys took it and then you've gone you built you know a couple of you know less successful businesses until you found sort of your niche in the supplement space it sounds like is there a particular aspect of the the business life cycle that excites you like are you one to sort of get to a certain level and you're like you know what like my work here is done like we're at 50 million in revenue and like I, i'm i'm done or you know um uh I'm going to get it confused again because they just have such similar names in Pixel Me and Pixel Fi. You guys are Pixel Fi? Got it. <laughs> um, but, you know, like I'd love to just understand around all the businesses and, you know, you, you, you're a, you guys are serial entrepreneurs at this point. Like why, you know, why look to get out of, uh, you know, the tech space in that capacity when you've got a great product? And, and honestly, I've heard from a lot of, sellers that use it how valuable it is and specifically yours um so just curious like what drives some of the decisions that that you guys make yeah it's a good question um yeah for sure we're definitely serial entrepreneurs i i I think especially me yeah i have like a tendency like to want to start new things i think um yeah, I think probably for the last like twenty four months, we've really just tried to focus on 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 two things, uh, which again, you know, is yeah, just like the agency, and then like the supplement brands, and then and that's it, and trying not to take on new things, which is, which is hard, you know, because it's more exciting, truthfully, right? It's uh, it, it's it's just fun to figure new things out, but I think yeah, to your point, like so much of it is like the consistency of of thinking in 10 year time horizons versus like 18 months or a year, right? And so, so much of it is just putting in those reps, I guess you would say. Um, I, I would say that in the in the beginning, I think it was in the earlier years, it was a little bit more like arrogance of just like, oh, I can, I can, I can juggle, I can multitask, I can do all these things. 
Um, and it's true, but I, I do think, yeah, if you kind of like zoom out and look at like, you know, the companies that have done the best is obviously like the ones that usually focused are usually the best ones. Uh, and so, yeah, and maybe that's a survivorship bias, but like uh, I would, yeah, I think for us right now at this stage, especially with everything kind of going on in the macro environment, our, what we've decided to do is actually just really to focus is just like find great clients that we want to like support and help them get to their, their goals and then and then do the supplement brands and not do everything else because there is just a lot you actually have to be way more involved if you're starting something uh something new versus like now we have such a strong leadership team across like the agency across our brands that it's just so much easier for us it's like hey we want to launch a new product or, or five new products next quarter i like the head of product development will find the products and we just kind of sign off on them they'll get launched like everything is now like pretty um yeah like not automated but like you know it doesn't require as much work and so honestly it's more important that we just spend time coaching the team and just being really clear about our expectations and like what's the most important thing like the okrs versus like trying to like start the next thing Mm, very apparent why Lippy is such a fan of you guys. Very, very apparent. Um, so, so y- you brought up a few points here, um, and and I want to dig a little deeper. Um, but you you talked about the fact that you know you're sort of cruising's not the word, you know, but you clearly have a, a very well oiled machine and a process when it comes to new product launches and. You know, that, that, that element is pretty buttoned down. Um, obviously, you know, you, you get the itch and you want to do something new and exciting. And, and that obviously happens from time to time. But I guess, <laughs> I guess at what point, at what point or how recently did you like g- grow up to be a real boy? And I say that as someone who's just launched, just launched a third, uh, you know, joint venture business here. And, uh, you know, I, I guess like, there's the, the excitement around what we're doing right now in this new joint venture and this new business and everything that's happening. But like, mate, if I'm honest, it's fucking exhausting. Like, you know, even though I have all of the resources and, you know, I've got a massive team behind me and we're absolutely leveraging the hell out of them and, they, you know, and that's all great. It's still like, it's still a new, totally new venture. It requires like, you know, a, a certain very focused, consistent, push and how i sort of look at entrepreneurship is it's like in in seasons or in like sort of like peaks and troughs and i've got like a very clearly defined sort of three to six month window right now that started about a month and a half ago where it's a push like i'm not i'm not having like the freedom that i'd like and so it sounds to me like you've gone through this process where you're cutting some of the fat and some of the distractions and you're getting focused and you even mentioned just before you talk in 10 year uh 10 year terminology now and that's about sort of your your goal setting and 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 where you're driving toward what potentially created that shift or when did it happen or I'm trying to, like I said to you before we hit record, I'm always trying to learn. I want to learn from people who have done more impressive things than I have and you know you seem to be someone who's really you've become very intentional about it. So yeah, curious. Yeah, it's a a great question. Um, I mean, I would say, yeah, I I think, yeah, I mean, COVID was an interesting time. I think for us, yeah, I mean, we definitely decided to to focus on a lot of the big, we, we had done too much and I think it was a good reset point for us in terms of just like really thinking about the business, like, and then, yeah, what we were trying to achieve, I think, um, yeah, I mean, we were definitely one of those like companies that just scaled super fast, sometimes with like, yeah, so, some areas had good process, others that, you know, just naturally didn't. Uh, and I, I think you just kind of realize that I mean, there will always be fires in a business, especially one built on the Amazon platform that's just so volatile. But I think, you know, kind of similar to what you were saying with like, you know, not having a child, um, neither of us have child, but it's just like, you know, as we got older, we wanted like less fires to put out ourselves. 
And I think um, by having less businesses and just focusing on the ones that would really help each other, like in terms of the flywheel, but and then also that we were just like the strongest in, then we would be able to like, yeah, just have a better quality of life. Uh, and so that was kind of like the decision. It's like, yeah, we can we can take on all these cool things uh, and, and it's going to be really fun. But like just at this stage, like and then wanting to go after like a big exit, we have like um, a focus on like a big exit, probably in like 2026, maybe then uh, for, you know, for some of the supplement brands, then, yeah, I think it just it makes sense to really focus versus like kind of continuing to divide all the the team's time, right? Like it's kind of like that snowball analogy, right? And, you know, when you're, uh, yeah, again, when you're younger, you don't like really think about it as much, but it's like, there is a real switching cost to like having your marketing team work on so many different things, right? And so just by having that like more narrow focus, you're just gonna get like, uh, yeah, just more momentum, I, I guess. And uh, it'll, it'll challenge all the other teams. And yeah, overall, I think we'll just be, yeah, trying to be more disciplined, I guess, is the way that we're looking at it. Yeah, I mean, it definitely makes a tremendous amount of sense to me and something that creates, you know, focus for the team, quality of life. And, you know, I think once you sort of uh, overcome that hustle life and culture that a lot of us have lived through, you understand that there is no longevity in that. And in order to, to sort of go the distance and to be able to think in 10 year horizons, you need to plan for them so mate i mean i'm looking at you here you look like a pretty fit guy what's your what is your what does your routine look like um like have you have you really invested in in designing your life and you're sort of intentional about the hours that you spend like you know and i, I know from me from from my perspective like i wake up every morning i'm out of the house by 6 a.m i'm i'm walking with a dog um you know i'm in the gym three four days a week and you, you know i i, I invest in in my my sanity, I meditate every day. I do my gratitude journaling. Like, curious to hear how you approach, you know, the other aspects outside of just you know building multiple businesses and helping sort of guide the team to success. For sure, yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've done a lot of the yeah the journal meditation. Yeah, truthfully, I, for me, and I know this is like almost taboo to say, but I just for me it didn't really make a huge difference. So I kind of uh, personally stopped those. But yeah, I kind of want to get back and, and try again and see if if it makes a difference. But I think yeah, fitness is huge for me. Um, so yeah, I recently, or I used to do like kind of more like triathlon, like Ironman competitions. Now I'm more into CrossFit. Um, so I've been doing that for a year. So yeah, pretty like dedicated to that about like five days a week. Um, yeah, I try. Um, time? Huh? What's your Fran time? Oh, I haven't done the Fran actually. Uh, are you, are you CrossFit or yeah, no, I haven't done the Fran actually. Um, yeah, I'm not I even sure be. what the workout is. I, 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 okay. I used to be 21.59 chin-ups and a 40, 40 kilo um, uh, thruster, I think it is, um, from memory. I, haven't, I, I, was a, I was a CrossFit coach maybe close to 15 years ago. Um, I stopped CrossFitting about 10 years ago. Yeah, but I used to compete heavily when in my mid-20s. Oh, nice. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, when I do the workout, I'll, I'll, I'll text you and let you know. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure yet. Um, yeah. So, but I think I, I spend a lot of time walking outside, yeah, with my fiance or just like walking, uh, and listening to podcasts. Um, so yeah, I'll probably walk, uh, recently, yeah, especially now that we're in Marseille, which is a beautiful city, uh, probably like 13,000 steps a day. So just trying to really spend a lot of time outside. And I think, uh, the, honestly, the biggest hack that I, I think some people do, not everybody, is just like meal plan services. So like before we get to any city, uh, my executive assistant will like basically do all the research of like, let's say I'm in Marseille. So it's like, yeah, the, the CrossFit gym near my Airbnb, like the meal service, like everything that we need, like cool Airbnb experiences that we want to do. Um, and so we'll just have that like ready to go so that the meals show up. And so it's just way easier. We'll still go out to dinner, um, but it just makes it obviously it's like way easier on time, obviously not having to go find food, but then also it just makes you like make the healthier choice. Um, and so that's 
like those are some of like the um, the bigger things that we do. I mean, that's a pretty that's a pretty solid life hack right there. Is the the meal prep and finding it in the different locations? I'd be terrified to see what it cost me here in Tel Aviv, um, but I was definitely red hot on it back um, back when I was crossfitting. And yeah, I mean, you know, that really is like very very well structured life design in like you know you're living what sounds like a very global life and being able to actually you know very very clearly plan out and having an executive assistant mate it's a lot it's a game changer isn't it when when uh oh. leveraged correctly is it is the greatest uh yeah honestly yeah I, I couldn't imagine going back like yeah they, they they're basically the glue right like they make everything I, I wouldn't show up to meetings otherwise uh so yeah no it's awesome mate i'm i'm, I'm the same i always laugh i'm like it now, like women run every single aspect of my life from my fiance to my dog and now Kate, who, who I've been working with for about a year. It's like, you know, they really just, they run shit. Um, and I'm just literally a passenger here. Like, what do I, you know, tell me what I have to do. Um, but, um, but yeah, unreal, mate. Well, listen, it would be an absolute shame to, um, to let this podcast end and not give Marketplace Ops a little bit of a plug and, and tell anyone who's listening um, a little bit more about sort of the solutions you offer and who, you know, who's actually going to be best to work with you. And like I was saying, I'm super excited to have the opportunity to work together as we really launch into South Coal now. So, uh, yeah, I'm asking again for myself as much as I am for the audience. Thanks, man. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate you. Um, so yeah, I mean, Marketplace Ops, we're like a full service Amazon strategy firm. So for the majority of clients, we'll handle everything from content to advertising, launching, supply chain, um, like catalog or like account health, um, all of that our, our team will t- uh, take care of. So basically the, the main things that we won't do is like kind of product development uh, and then um, and photography, but pretty much everything else will um, will kind of act as kind of like the chief Amazon officer, if you will, for the brand, and then basically help the client hit the OKRs uh, that they're looking for. And then um, over the next few months, actually, we're we're kind of just starting to introduce kind of more standalone services. So we'll do like PPC only, like supply supply chain only. Um, but yeah, up until now, it's been all full service. But naturally, since we already have like the teams built out, um, we wanted to create like other offerings for for some of the other sellers and uh, that maybe only one specific uh, one of those specifically. And so those will probably be launched in the next like forty five days or so. Wow, very cool. And is there a specific niche or category? Like, are you guys trying to stick closely towards supplement, or you sort of handle, uh, you know, broad stroke anyone? Anyone's welcome. Is there a, a minimum, uh, you know, a minimum threshold? Again, I'm very curious to know for for my personal <laughs> endeavors mm-hmm. here. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, on the fir- the full service side, usually the brand is doing at least like 50K a month in revenue, at least on one channel or they're venture backed. Um, in terms of categories for full service, um, yeah, it really varies, but we work with a lot of like uh, consumables, could be like supplements, grocery, uh, electronics, like health and personal care, beauty. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, like pretty like across again, we don't do clothing, like that's a specific category that we won't, um, that we won't do, but we've, we've touched like a lot of, uh, categories on the full service side. Um, yeah, on the advertising and the supply chain, uh, only like, yeah, we're, we're, we're more open specifically on those services. And so, but yeah, I would say that the criteria is probably going to be around the same, usually like around probably like 30 or 50 K a month in revenue, like minimum, just to be able to, to kind of justify like the, the fees and then yeah of course we really want um yeah we, we want brands that have some traction so that we can kind of add fuel to the fire kind of similar to i'm sure what you guys are doing uh with south coal but yeah um yeah unfortunately we don't want to build businesses anymore uh oh yeah we're, we're trying to like help scale businesses so that they can you know I, I ideally hit their goals and exit at some point Mate, that is uh, great to know and uh, we'll be talking about it more. But uh, Fernando, mate, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, it was awesome to get to connect and, and also just learn about what you've been able to achieve. It's really nothing short of remarkable. So just appreciate you jumping on here today. Yeah, man. Anytime. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate you. It was fun.